today. Be sensitive to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, everyone here today, uh, if you're a believer, the Bible says that you should be a seeker. A seeker. And that means that we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the move of God. That the Bible says that God intervenes and pours out His Spirit upon those that would, uh, would seek Him. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Can you say amen? Blessed are those that have a hunger and a thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I like what Jeremiah spoke in Jeremiah 29, verse 13. I got a lot of, a lot of scripture today, and it's all going to tie in together. As I was putting this together, the Holy Spirit was leading me. I'll just say that. In Jeremiah 29, verse 13, the Bible says, And you will seek me, there's the word seek, and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And so I want to just give you a word because the Bible says that we are seekers. Can you say that with me? Seekers. And to look out and, and to see what the word actually means in, in biblical terminology of the word seek or seeker, it means to seek, to, to seek for. It means thinking how to do something or what to obtain, to ascertain meaning, to inquire, to desire, to endeavor, to strive for. It means coveting, striving after God. It means that you are seeking carefully and intensively and prayerfully and diligently and zealously seeking after God. Uh, one of the things that was dropped in my spirit is that as a believer we should be have a life that desires and endeavors and seeks the presence and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the word that was dropped in my spirit was the word hunt. How many have ever been on the hunt for something? My wife is on the hunt for Ray Dunn, amen. And I, I take her different places and there's certain things that she wants to go, go uh, look at it, and certain uh, pottery that she likes, but we need to be on the hunt, we need to be seeking, we need to be desiring to have more of God in our lives. Can you say amen? More of God. So today, I want to look at a couple of core values. I won't be able to do them all because uh, I'm going to do two today. Because I believe God has given us a, a vision for our church. Now I want to say this. Above everything that I say this morning, above everything that I speak about the core value of our church, I want you to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is saying. And I want you to, here it is again, I want you to listen to the voice behind the voice. The voice behind the voice is the voice of God, and I'm just a messenger of what God has given me. And so today, the Holy Spirit wants to move in our lives, and we need to be sensitive so we can understand and get the meaning of what God is saying. Someone said these words, life falls into place only with God. How many of you ever tried to make it on your own and find out, you know what, man, I just blew it? Well, here this statement, this quote says, life falls into place only with God. Now, I'm going to talk about something today. It was King David, and King David had a hunger and a thirst for God. The Bible said that David was a man that was after God's own heart. That David had, had the heart of God, that he sought the heart of God. So in the book of Psalms, chapter 23, verse 6, in the New Living Translation, I like the words of David here. Now listen carefully to what David says. He says, surely goodness and unfailing love will pursue me. Now you've got to understand what this is saying. Surely the goodness and the unfailing love of God will pursue me. Can somebody say amen? amen? That he will pursue me. Then David says, all the days 
of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now in this, I like what it says because it says, Surely the goodness and mercy and unset veiling love will pursue me. Now God is speaking to David's heart. He is dealing with David the same way that God deals with us. And we understand that God is called a shepherd, and that we are the sheep, and that sheep need to be guided by a shepherd. Just as well as David was, was a shepherd, and he guided the sheep, you and I need to be guided by God. But I like what David said, because he understood that, you know, in my life, the unfailing love, that the goodness of God will pursue me all the days of my life. Can I tell you something, beloved, this morning? God is pursuing you. Can you say amen? amen? That God wants you. That He is pursuing you. That His Spirit, amen, is a spirit that, that there was a vision. And I don't want to give you the whole vision. But last week when we had Art McAllister, there was a man that was over here by the name of, make sure I get it right, his wife's name was Angela, his name was Ray. And he's an evangelist. And before Art began to preach, he taught, uh, God had given his wife a vision about our church. And I don't have the whole vision. I'm going to give you some of it. And the vision was is that she seen a cloud that was above our church like smoke. And in his message, he talked about the smoke of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And she said that the smoke went down and it began to go down the aisles of the church. And she said that there were rumblings, much like, uh, and, and we have the, the, uh, the uh, what they call those, the volcanoes that have the volcanic uh, eruption underneath that you don't know about. But it is actually all the time being hot and it is all, like, all the time molting. And she said there is something, that smoke is going down all the aisles and certain aisles of the church. And it is resting upon people. And she said, don't worry about the numbers. Don't worry about what you see. But she says what she seen was a voice that was strong as a thousand people that were worshiping God. And you don't see what's happening under that volcano. But there is actually an eruption. And there is something that is happening. Now, don't worry about what you see. And understand that the Holy Spirit is about to break out. And God is pursuing you. Can you say amen? amen. Now, in this goodness, God was working on David's life just like he works on our lives. And God was watching over David just like a shepherd watched, watches over the sheep. Now, we understand that David watched over the sheep. He protected the sheep. He killed the lion. He killed the bear. And he was there watching over the sheep. And the previous verse, uh, and, and, and the same verses in this, uh, and, and Psalms here that we're talking about, 23, it talked about that he is a good shepherd, that although I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thy rod and thy staff it comforts me. You will make my, give me peace and lay even at the table of my enemy, that you will protect me. Can I tell you something, amen? God is pursuing his church. God is pursuing you. And you need to be comfortable in who you are and understand that although you walk through heavy valleys, that although you may be going through a trial, or that although you may be hurting today, that God is pursuing you, that God is with you. And David says that he is with me all the days of my life. And I want to be in his presence. And I want to be in his house. And David said, I will always be in the house and the presence of God. Can somebody say amen? All right, if I preach a little bit this morning. Amen. And so God is pursuing us. God is a merciful God. God uh, led David to the mindset that, and the assurance that he was a shepherd and that he would always be with him. Here David says that he that I want to pursue him all the days of my life. That although I'm going through different situations, and there is a variety of change in my life, that I understand that he reaches close to me, and that the very ending of my life, that he is still guiding me and protecting me all along the way, 
So David is feeling a confidence and he's assured and that God is with him wherever he goes. Whatever he's going through. Whatever he's facing. Whatever depression. Whatever the enemy has told you that you are no good and you will never amount to nothing and made you feel like you're never going to be anything. Let me tell you something. God is pursuing you and perfecting you and like the volcano down below there's eruption. God is getting ready to break out in your life and you need to accept this like David did. That I understand that God is pursuing you. Amen. Hallelujah. All the days of my life, the length of my days in Hebrew is what it means. And here's the key. David understood the key to it all. That if I want God's blessing, I must always want to dwell in the house of the Lord. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now here's the thing we're talking about, and the brother we're talking about today. Amen. He was up in, was it Kingdom? Or no, Paul Park? One of our fellowship churches at Praise Chapel over there. There was a guy talking about, man, we used to have church every day. He goes in there like, you know what? That's what kept us saved back then. We were in church all the time. That's what kept us saved. But we are living in a time today, folks, where people are so busy that their minds are so encumbered that they are gripped by this, gripped by the social media, gripped by this and gripped by that. As a matter of fact, if you have your cell phone, shut it off right now, please. Shut it off. Don't be scrolling around on your cell phone while I'm preaching the Word. Amen? The Word of God. You need to be focused on the Word of God. Right. Amen? Yes, amen? So, it's very important that we establish the strong foundation that we are committed to the local house of God where we go. What does this say? David said that I would never forsake meeting in the house of God, that it has become a lifestyle to me, and it is my number one priority. I'm almost, almost getting to where we're supposed to be. Amen. It gives me entry. Psalms 27, verse 4. Listen to these words. David says, the one thing that I ask of the Lord, one thing. Somebody say one thing. The one thing that I ask of the Lord the thing that I seek after the most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now when David says one thing, he says it is my desire that I seek after the most to seek God and to be faithfully committed to his house. Now we know David couldn't be in the house of God 24-7. We know that. But what David is talking about is... I seek to be in the presence of God every moment of my life. Can you say amen? amen? And so what David is saying is, is that I want to be in the house of God. I have a desire to be in His presence. And every believer that is under this roof today, you need to be a seeker of God. A seeker. David said, one thing I desire. One thing I want to establish, and it is in my heart, that I want to be in the presence of God. How many have ever just been in a supernatural, powerful revival? Where God begins to do supernatural things. And you see people getting healed, and souls getting saved, and great things happening. That happens to people that seek God and have one thing that David said, this one thing I want, and that is the desire of my heart, it is everything that I have, to be in the supernatural, powerful presence of Almighty God. Amen. That brings revival. Numerous times David said, I seek to establish the one thing. In Psalms 26 verse 8, the Bible says, I love your sanctuary, Lord, the place where your glory shines. Now, let, 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 me, let, me, let you 
this up. This is the sanctuary. But how many understand that this is a sanctuary too? That this is a temple too? That this right here, this right here, this heart, this being, this soul right here, you as individuals, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And He longs to dwell that temple. This is the place where we meet. It's the sanctuary. It's where we fellowship. And the Bible says that we're not to forsake it in Hebrews 10, 23. That we're not to forsake the siblings of ourselves together as a manner of some do. That we need to come into the house of God. Can somebody say amen? David said Psalms 84, verse 4. How happy are those who can live in your house always singing your praise. I don't know about you, but I love singing. I don't sometimes sound that good, but I love singing. I used to think I do. <laughs> and when I was younger, I didn't sound good. But when you get older, you become a preacher, you quit singing like you used to. Yeah. Amen? Psalm 69 doesn't mean I'm going to stop, though. I'm going to it. It, 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 it's a joyful, joyful noise to me. Amen. And it, it, it sounds like a, a bird tweeting, or it sounds like a crow crocking. Amen. I don't care. Amen. As long as you're worshiping God, it is wonderful to God. Psalm 69 verse 9 says, Passion for your house burns within me. Passion for your house burns within me. So we see here that David obviously said, I want the faithful to be close and attend to, to be near. I want to desire in my heart to seek after God at all times. Now the question I want to ask you today as a church is, now listen to me, I want to ask you a question. And that is, and I want you to be honest here, how much of God's presence do you see? Quiet in here. Come on. How much of God's presence are you seeking after? David wanted it more than anything else in his life. In the book of Job, chapter 23, verse 12, Job said these words, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I had treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job said that I treasured God more than my necessary food for survival. Another scripture says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. I was glad. So we see Job and David, they had a heart that pointed in the direction of always seeking after God's presence. They, David wanted to live in God's house. He's saying this, and I'm going to tell you something. Every man and woman of God should have a desire to follow hard after God, to seek for His presence, to have a hunger for God's presence. And you want to be near God. You want Him in your life. And, and I like this. David said, I desire one thing. Not a million things. Not Facebook. Not Instagram. Not your games and all the things that we got. Uh, video games. Kids play them for hours. And I'm not knocking those things. But see one thing, David said. And I'm telling you, the more I get into the Word of God, the more I understand that if I want the anointing to rest upon my life, I need to have a mind that is focused upon God. I need to keep my vision straight on God because there are too many distractions in this world that will distract you. And the next thing you know, seeking God and coming to the house of God, you won't want to be there anymore. You've got other things that's more important than that. Why is it so quiet in here? <laughs> Next time I'll hand out hot hard hats and steel toed shoes. How that? Yeah. The Word of God should cut. It should go in there. It should challenge us. Because I want to be filled up to the brim of God. You know, when you have a heart for God that seeks God, like a seeker's life, you'll be filled with God's presence so much that you can't help but exhibit who He is in your life around those that come around you. It will leak out, amen. You'll be a leaky Christian. Amen. 
Uh, you said living epistle last week. I heard you say that. A living epistle means that your, your actual life will be an open book for other people to read. Amen. You'll be the author. God has led you, and it's open, and they'll see it, and they'll go, wow, that is something that attracts me. It, it is something that I look at. How many have ever sat down and read a good book? Amen. It will be noticeable. It will be evident that God is moving in your life. You'll become like a life-giving person. You will be a life extender to others because you are living and speaking the life of God that is working in and through your life. So you've been hearing me talk about this. I preached that in a few weeks. Now here's one, number one. Our church is a life-giving church. I already preached the whole message on this, but I'm just going to touch on it today. In Psalms, listen to this. Psalms chapter 71, verse 7 and 8. Listen to these words in the New Living Testament. It says, My life is an example to many. My life is an example to many. Because you have been my strength and protection, that is why I can never stop praising you, and I declare your glory all day long. Now, here's what I think we need to see. Is that David says is that my life is an example to many. A life giver is always giving out. They're willing to serve others. They love others. They extend life to others. And why is that? Because they are full of life, the life of God. Can somebody say amen? Life givers handle life, and no matter what situation they are in, they speak words of faith in all circumstances. Throughout every season of life, doesn't matter if it's good or bad. And here's the word. They have learned. Somebody say learn. Learn. How many know life is a teacher? They have learned how to stay focused on one thing. On one thing. They are in tune with God. When you stay focused and in tune with God, you will find contentment in all circumstances of life. Doesn't matter what you're going through. Doesn't matter what you're facing. When you stay focused on one thing to God, you, it, will, it will lead you and guide you and you will learn to be content and sold out to God in all things. Uh, I like what it says here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 and 13. The Bible says, not that, this is Paul, he says, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned, there's the word learned again, how to get along happily, whether I have much or I have little. I know how to live in almost nothing or with everything. I have learned, there it is again, the secret of living in every situation, whether it is full, a full stomach or an empty stomach, with plenty or little, for I can do everything with the help of Christ who gives me the strength that I need. So here's what a life-giving person does. Uh, life-giving people learn, first of all, how to be content, and they're happy in all areas of their life. And that's because they've learned, say it again, learn, that although I may not have everything that I want, I have everything that I need. Come on, somebody. Amen. Although I may not have everything that I want, I have everything that I need. They learn the importance of trusting God in all things. So nothing moves them from their purpose. Because they learn how to be content. They learn how to weather the storms. They learn how to stay true. They learn how to stay steadfast. They learn how to stay unmovable. They learn how to, you know what, like a water off a duck's back, that things just roll off their back. Because understand this, that good people go through bad things. Godly people go through rough times. Everybody faces good and bad. There are good seasons, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There is a reason for everything under the sun. There are good times and bad times. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. We all go through issues in life. But you need to understand that if you're focused on one thing, it will never defer your purpose and your love for the things of God. Amen. Amen? I like what it says here. It's a learned value. That God pursues me, David said, at all times. That the important thing is that we learn to trust God in all things. And so, it is a learned process. Now listen to this. It's a value of being happy and sold out to God in all areas. 
And honestly, let me say this. Honestly, as God's people, if you're ever going to experience a true breakthrough in your life, you're going to have to learn to be content and sold out to God no matter what you're facing. Amen. Say amen. Amen. You're going to have to learn to be content and sold out to God no matter what you're facing. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 is the first part of it. It says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Let me move on. So life giving is a life that is focused in the pursuit of seeking God. As seekers, it's giving out life to others. It's a spoken word, maybe of, of affirmation to somebody's life, or, or even open, open rebuke is better than the kisses of the enemy, having to be rebuked because you did something wrong and you needed it, so you're correcting it. And so you openly rebuke and see actions and the deeds of maybe even be disciple, being taught. And, 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 and I like what David said. He says, my life has become an example to many. Let me ask you something. When you are a believer and you're living for God, your life, David says, my life has become an example for many. You understand that the way that you live your life should be a living epistle for other people to read. It should be an example, a living example. You should be a life-giving person, and there must be something in your life that is an example for many others, like David said, to follow. Now, here's one of the things that I thought about. We have life-giving, and here's the second point. So we're a life-giving church. If you want to know what our vision is, life-giving. We want to give out life in all circumstances, in the good seasons and in the bad seasons. We want to be a people of faith that press through, that don't stop, that don't quit. Amen. I can't tell you how many people that can tell you so that, you know what, I don't listen to words anymore. I have your back, preacher. Okay? And then just sit down and serve God. Amen. <laughs> we'll see. First time they get hit with a trial, they're gone. Amen. You know what? God is looking for Christians that are weathered people. Then weather. They learned how to weather a few storms. They've been through a few, you know. Let me tell you, it's one of the best things that I've learned in life. I don't like it, but what happens is that we learn from the school of what? Our knots. And many times it's the best teacher. And so secondly, we want not only to be life-giving, we want to be growing spiritually, growing spiritually. Now, now there's so many things that attack God's people today to stop us from growing. Number one is busyness. How many ever get so busy that you don't have enough time? Your time is, 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 is everything grabbing at your time. That will stop you from growing. A lack of quality time. Hardships that you go through. Sicknesses that you face. Weariness, stress. And even this, laziness. Say amen or oh me. You're just flat out lazy. And the reason why you're not going is this face, face it, look at the man in the mirror, is you don't prioritize and stay focused on growing spiritually because you're lazy. And you can't grow spiritually if you allow all these other things to distract you. I, I can't tell you, there's some people who are very good at making excuses. They're like Epstein and Welcome Back Potter. I don't know, that dates me. But back in the 70s, there used to be this show, Welcome Back, Welcome Back. And Epstein was in this class, and, and Carter was a teacher. And he missed school all the time. And he'd say, you know what, this is that, this is that. He always had an excuse. The only problem is he forget what he wrote six months ago, and he'd use the same excuse, Grandma died again. And how many know that excuses are like, you know, are like every one of us can come up with so many different excuses. And we live in a world today that wants to excuse away them not growing. Well, I've got this problem. And you know what the Bible says? That in the last days, right before Jesus comes back, and it will be like the days of Noah where people are giving and giving in marriage. There will be party and revelry. People will be doing their own thing, caught up in their own thing. And all of a sudden, the Lord comes back and they're wondering why I didn't go to heaven. Why did not make me have to go through the tribulation period and die a martyr if you want to go to heaven? I'm going to tell you why. Because you're so busy being body and busy body with other things. Say amen or oh me. Someone said this, unless you try to do something beyond what you already mastered, 
you will never grow. We don't want to plateau as Christians. We want to be continually growing in the things of God. Someone said this, everything can be improved. Everything can be improved. If somebody tells you you can never get any better, you call them a liar. I'm going to tell you, that pastor said you can call them a liar. If they tell you you can never get better, let me tell you, everything can, can have improvement. Everything can be improved. Don't listen to naysayers. As a matter of fact, if your life is surrounded by naysayers, amen, get another group of people. Because they'll drag you down. Move on. Move on, they'll say to God. Rise up. Hearken unto the voice of God. Do what God has called you to do. And be a believer. As a believer in every season in life. But you know, don't, don't, don't try to hide your face down in the sand and act like nothing is happening either. Don't be a Christian and tap your face down in the sand that's not willing to deal with reality. Because reality hits us all. Yeah. Yeah. Continue going on. Yeah. Luke 8, verse 14. It says, The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those, stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. And they do not mature. But the seed of a good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and they persevere and they produce a crop. Mm. So growing people face challenges. Let me say that again. You missed a good place to say amen. Growing people face challenges. That's right. Yeah, I need to be like he did, so I can put everything up there like he did. I wish I could do that. I'm not real savvy, but I'm going to go to school for it. I want you to be able to see the things that I, I, I'm going to go back to school. Amen. I'm going to become cuter, computer savvy like you young folks are. Amen. Amen. You face challenges. They have resolved in their heart that they are willing to stay focused, to press through, to be all that they can be for God. They don't focus on the things that are around them, the choke them, the worries, the riches, and the pleasures. Listen, they must cultivate their hearts in all areas so that, or they can't grow spiritually. It doesn't mean that you're not going through rough times, but when you allow other things to have your priority in life, then listen, David didn't allow that. There were other things that tried to distract the apostles Joe, Paul, and all the different portions of Scripture, but they practiced persevering to be fruitful in their life. They understood that they weren't going to have a bumper crop right away. They were just going to sow seeds, and tomorrow when we wake up, we got a crop. Hogwash. You're going to sow that seed? You're going to have to go in and cultivate that ground before you sow the seed? You're going to sow that seed? You're going to have to water that seed? You're going to have to work the ground. You're going to have to pull out the weeds. You're going to have to nurture that plant. You won't have a bumper flock, but as long as you stay faithful and you stay committed and you keep working that field, you will have a crop, the Bible says. That you will have production. That you will be a producing Christian. And although you go through tough times, that happens. You have a kingdom investment. You're planting seed. It is a kingdom investment. And the end result is it isn't the immediate circumstances that you're facing. It isn't what you're going through right now. It's not the immediate circumstances that try to get you down. The end result is you get by those circumstances. And you begin to trust God through the circumstances. And you say, you know what? I may not have a crop yet, but I can see it coming. Amen. Hallelujah. I can see it in the Spirit. Amen. I can see some 30, 60, 100 fall. Amen. Coming my way. Amen. I know it's coming. And I'm staying faithful. Because as David said, my God is with me. He pursues me all the days of my life. So I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That I will be in His presence. Before you give others spiritual discipleship, you must be growing yourself. Amen. There are several ways to grow. One's discipleship. That's where you have a mature believer, someone that's been 
saved for a while, that have stayed the course, that have invested their life, that have studied and went through some storms and weathered some storms. Don't go seeking somebody to disciple you that can't even make it till tomorrow. That's not somebody you want to disciple you. You want somebody who's weathered a few storms. You want somebody to stay the course. You want somebody that's seasoned is the word. That doesn't mean they have to be perfect. Here's the problem with a lot of people. They think you have to be perfect. But how many understand we live in an imperfect world with imperfect people and God uses imperfect people? Yes, amen. Amen. <laughs> You're looking at one. He uses us because although you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, although you face these things, David fought, fought, uh, you know, fought all kinds of uh, uh, things that happened and delivered in his life. But David come to the conclusion in the, in, in the opening chapter that we read that although I'm going through these things, amen, and I feel distracted at times, my God still is pursuing me. And so that brought David's confidence right back up. Understand that when you're going through something, that God is pursuing you to bring you back up to where you need to be. But you need to yield to Him. Okay. So it plays out with dividends in your life. You must yield. You must yield. So when you grow up through face, then you face the challenges. Listen to this. These are difficulties and lessons that are learned. You learn to persevere. James 1.4 says this, Perseverance must finish, Perseverance must finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Is that up there? Perseverance must finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. That's the NIV. Perseverance, listen to this, Perseverance, people that learn to persevere, equals learning and growth. Perseverance equals learning and growth. I don't know. I always have so much uh, stuff. Let's just get this going. So in all our lives, we must be growing maturity. We must allow our lives to be stretched, to grow. We must learn to persevere. And let me tell you this. There are different levels of growth in all our lives. Amen. So we need to have a little patience with people. Where you may have a strength, maybe somebody else's weakness. Where I may have a strength, maybe your weakness. And so we all help each other. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, the Bible says, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, listen to this, man, this is crazy. When I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would a mature Christian. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in the Christian life. I had to feed you with milk and not with solid food because you couldn't handle anything stronger. And you still aren't ready, for you are still controlled by your own sinful desires. You're jealous of one another. You quarrel with each other. And now, that, that, doesn't that prove that you're controlled by your own desires? You're acting like people who don't belong to the Lord. When one says that I am a follower of Paul, and another says I, am, I prefer Apollos, aren't you acting like those that are mere, uh, not Christians? Now, now, what this is talking about is Paul saying, that you chose the easy road. A lot of Christians want the easy road. And, and, and you can't mature in that. They, you can't mature. If you're going to grow as a believer, you've got to be able to take the tough, tougher teaching and be ready to be stretched and challenged. Paul says, I couldn't tell you the deeper things because you were not ready and you're still infants and you have not grown. You can't handle this strong being and you're controlled by your own desires. But David says, I have one desire. I have one desire, David said. And if you're going to be ready to be discipled and grow in God, you must have one desire to be ready to be trained. You must have an attitude of one desire. I couldn't teach you because you weren't ready, he says. Why? Because if you really want to learn, you must stay ready. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. You got to get rid of the distractions and be committed. Be in the right mind to be able to receive. Be focused and ready to receive. Shut off your cell phones, like I said. Amen. 
Shut up, you mean I'm going to tell you whatever. <laughs> He's looking at me like, I shut mine off. Amen. It's because, how many, you know, I can't tell you how many times that I've been in church, church services, and it could be the preachers just got fireballs come off his fingertips. I mean, he's just preaching up a storm. But you always have people that are distracted. Amen. The enemy is very good at getting people distracted. Amen. He doesn't want you to learn. He doesn't want you to be filled with God's presence. He doesn't want you to get the breakthrough that you need in your life. Paul says in Philippians 2, I mean 3.12, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved the things or that I've already reached perfection, but I keep working toward the day that I will finally be all that Christ Jesus saved me for and wants me to be. No, dear brothers and sisters, I am not all that I should be. That sounds like me. How about you? I am not all that I should be. I'm not what I want to be yet, but I like what Paul says. But I'm focusing all my energies on this one thing. There it is again. Now Paul says this one thing. The same thing as David did. And the same thing that Job said. I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us upward to heaven. I hope that all of you who are mature Christians will agree on these things. If you disagree on some point... I believe God will make it plain to you, but we, now listen, listen to verse 16, but we must be sure to obey the truth that we have learned already. You, you know what the Bible says to him that knows the truth and does it not, it becomes sin. Mm -hmm. And so, to obey the truth that has been delivered of what you've learned. So what you learn, you must put it into practice. There's a quote that said this, Christians are educated much higher than they are of their level of obedience. Most Christians, they got a good education. They just won't obey. They know what to do. And here Paul says, listen, what you need to do is that you need to always obey the truth of what you've learned already, what you already know. What you know already. That's obedience. To bring this down. Hebrews 5, 4 says, solid food is for those who are mature, who have trained themselves. The word trained. Say trained. They train themselves to recognize the difference they know the difference between right and wrong, and then what to do, and they do what is right. So spiritual maturity, somebody that's spiritual mature, they always follow up with an action of doing what is right. Ephesians 4.14 says, then we will no longer, now listen to this, I like what, what it says here. After you mature, then we will no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe, because someone has told us something different, or because someone has collectively lied to us, and made the lie to sound like it's the truth. Instead, we will hold the truth in love, becoming more and more in every way like Christ, who is the head of the body of the church. Under his direction, the whole body is fitly, perfectly joined together, as each part does its own, here, listen to this, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow, so that the whole body is healthy and growing in the fullness of love in God. Now here's what I want you to see. There's several things here, real quick, and I'll be done with this, is that we all have a part to play. You have a part to play. Your spiritual maturity should be bleeding off into other people's lives. Amen. Right. You have a part to play. You may be here today and you say, well, you know what? I, I, I don't have a story. Can I tell you something? You all have a story. Amen. And if you're going to grow spiritually, it means that you're playing a part you, are, you, are, you have a part to play, that you have something to offer spiritually into the lives of other people. It says that there's a special work, that each part does its own special work, and it helps the other parts grow, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So this is a challenging portion of Scripture here. It says we all have a part to play, that we should be maturing our whole, so the whole body is healthy, growing, and each part has its own work. And you know what I like when Paul says that we are fitly, perfectly joined together. Do you know what you may say? Here's the problem in a lot of things today, is that most people, they say in most churches, only stay there three years and they move on. There's no commitment. Most people aren't committed. As a matter of fact, you think about marriage today. you got the prenuptial agreement. I'm going to marry that clown, but he ain't getting this. I worked hard for it. Amen. Okay. <laughs> you know what I told my wife when I married her? 
When, I, when she married me and she asked for the keys, I gave her the keys. You know why I gave her the keys? Because it's her keys. She won't have to ask me, can I drive the car? Take the keys. It's your car. Can, can, I, can I have this? No, you can have it. It's yours. You're, you married me. Whatever is mine is yours. Amen. And God is saying to you, listen, I got all the goods. I got everything. And I'm married unto you. I thought I loved you, that I controlled you, that I pursued you. But you're acting like you're a stepchild. You're acting like, you know, there's nothing that, you're acting like, you know, there's nothing. You know, let me tell you something. You know what a real dad is, hey amen? A real dad is a man that can marry somebody that already has kids, and he loves them like they're his own. Amen. Too many people today are selfish. They're selfish. And God doesn't look for selfish Christians. God looks for liberal Christians. The Bible says that the liberal soul shall be made fat. Amen. I'll tell you what. It's much more blessed to give. And now, Jesus, it doesn't say this in the Scripture. We like to quote it. But someone said in the Scripture that this is the words of the Lord. That it is much more blessed to give than it is to receive. Yes. Amen. I, I, my grandson, man, I love the little booger. He slobbers all over me. Amen. But he comes to the room in the morning. And I got this thing I do every morning. I put him up in my face just like this. And the first thing he does is put that little foot right in my face. <laughs> and then drool. The other day I woke up and I went, what is this? There was drool. You have a father today. A father. When you're weeping. When you're drooling. When you're crying out. He said, come. I have more today, but listen, if you want to grow spiritually, you need to understand, first of all, that God is pursuing you, that he wants you to grow, that he wants you. First Peter 2, 2, as a newborn baby desires a sincere milk of the word, that they may grow their life. He wants to grow you. He wants to feed you. So he doesn't just want you to always be on a bottle. But five years later, I'm a baby Christian. Oh. Paul said, I tried to feed you meat. I couldn't do it because you hadn't grown up yet. You're not mature. You're still a baby. You're lazy. You haven't grown. Let me ask you something. Have you grown as a Christian since last year? You know what a lot of people like to do? Blame it on the preacher. I only got you one day a week. You got six more days. Have you read your Bible this week? Have you prayed this week? It's always my fault. Let me tell you something. Shame on you. If you want me to make it to heaven for you, you can go to hell. Huh? I can't save you. Only God can. And so if you think I got this special word that I'm going to come over and anoint you with, let me tell you something. You, get, you start pursuing God. You be like what the scripture said. Man, Moses said, I want to see the face of God. That I desire your presence. Job said, I want it more than my necessary food. Jeremiah said, I am hungering for it. That I weep for it. He wept over God. The souls of men. When was the last time you just fell down before God and began to weep out and said to complain about your problems? That's be real. We need to prioritize who we're seeking and focus, as David said, on one thing and understand that he's pursuing you and that he loves you. And you know what you do when you understand that God loves you? You just surrender. You know, God, I can't do it. Now, how many ever tried to do it and you couldn't do it? Come on. You tried hard, it just wouldn't work out. I gotta tell you, that seems like the story of most of our lives. Here's what you do. Here's what you do. Come 
I'm yours, God. I'm yours. Everything you want, everything I am, I'm yours. What does you want me to do? What does you want me to say? What is it you, where do you want me to go? What is your will? What is your purpose for my life? I'm yours. When you do that, God, I say, guess what? I got an assignment. And that assignment is for you. And I'm going to fill you with joy. I'm going to fill you with life. Most Christians are bored, you know why? Because they won't step out and do anything. Come on. Come on now, somebody. Don't shout me down. They don't seek God for anything. They, they, they want God to be like, they think God's a genie in a bottle. This is what I want, God. I'll pop out the genie. I got three wishes. What do you want? That's not God. You got to be willing to seek God in the good times and the bad times in every situation and maturity will come your way. Can you say amen? Let's give God a hand. So you will grow in faith, strong and vigorous in the truth that you were taught. Let your life so overflow with thanksgiving to be all that he has done for you. You know what? Let's pray. Father, today, God, I pray, God, that you would just minister to our hearts. Or those that may be have had their minds, Lord, separated from really seeking you like they should, Lord. You said the worry 